All right, I want to start by asking you a question. The question is, who built the city that you live in? Who built the city that you grew up in? And in this city that you live in or you grew up in, what side of town did you live in? Did you live on the nice side of town or did you live on the bad side of town? And I ask that question because it gets me thinking about a game. You see, it, it asks for me the question of who's in control of our cities and who has the, the decisions to impact the communities that we live in. So let me start with, with this. I wonder, have any of you ever heard of the game called SimCity? Yeah, so SimCity, for those folks who are not familiar with, is a game that I was absolutely obsessed with growing up in the 90s. It's a computer game, and it's a city simulation game. So what you do is you have a blank slate, and you get to build your city from scratch. You get to decide where the roads go, where the hospitals, where the universities, the police stations, and the parks go. And as a kid, you sometimes want to have a little fun, and you put things where they don't belong, so you'll put the zoo in the middle of the new subdivision you built, and eventually the, the lion will break out, and in the game, when you press play, these notifications will plop, they'll pop up, and they'll say you know, letters and angry letters from the Neighborhood Association, and then they'll start protesting, and then eventually they'll riot and burn your city down if you don't build the city appropriately. <laughs> And so for me, the, when I was playing the game, I loved to play the game because what I was trying to do was build a great city, build an equitable city. And I was trying to build a place where every community member had access to public transportation, had access to universities and schools uh, and clinics. Uh, but for me, the reason I loved the game so much was because growing up, my reality, as opposed to my virtual reality, where I was at the computer screen making the decisions, was much different. For me, my neighbors and my friends and my community members and my family, we didn't really have a choice or a voice when it came to making those big decisions. So really, it had me wondering, who controls our city? Who builds our communities? And if they've been building our communities for generations, why is it that they've been building these communities to be so unequal? Why is it that in one side of town, your life outcomes, the variations to upward mobility is so drastically dependent on where you're born and it's so drastically dependent on where you end up? And so I thought to myself, you know what? I want to be the person making the decisions. So I got this crazy idea. When I got too old for the computer game, if there is such a thing, I decided that at the age of 24, back in 2011, that I wanted to run for office, that I wanted to be on the city council because I wanted to make the decisions for my city. I wanted to build my own city. So here's what I did. For five months, I knocked on 3,178 doors. It was the longest job interview of my life. And I want to tell you about the very first door I knocked on, because if you're a good candidate, this is what you do. You have the list of all of the people who have voted, and you go out and you knock on doors. And so the very first door I knocked on was Miss Rodriguez, and I go through one of these little numbers, knock, knock, knock. She comes to the door, and she opens it. And before she can shut it in my face, I say, Miss Rodriguez, I'm so sorry to bother you. I wanted to introduce myself. My name is Ray Saldana. I'm running for city council. I was born and raised in the community, went to the public high schools, went off to college, and I came back. And I want to run uh, for city council. Can I count on your vote? And she looked at me with this look in confusion. She said, you say you're running for the city council or you're running for the student council? Because <laughs> you're, certainly, you're certainly not old enough to be my councilman. Remember, that was the first door of 3,178. It was a long five months in the Texas heat. But eventually, I was elected as the youngest councilman in San Antonio. And <laughs> And I said to myself, okay, now I'm in the driver's seat. Now I get to make decisions about what the city's gonna look like and where the investments will go and if we have a million dollars, where that million dollars will go. But here's what I want to talk about. I learned something, not only in the experience of running for office, but I learned something actually being in office. And for a while, I didn't know if it was by accident that our communities were this unequal or if it was on purpose, but in my experience, I can tell you that it's actually on purpose, and I'm gonna tell you exactly how that is. You see, we create these communities. Actually, 
I should say, we're in the community that I represent here today on the south side of San Antonio. And my community, like the community of millions of others all across the country, is the type of community that struggles with a history and a reputation. And that history is one of neglect, of being overlooked, of poor health outcomes, of low performing schools, of, of issues of inequality. And so the statistics tell me this. They tell me that it is more likely that you would find me and my family members and my friends and residents caught in a cycle of poverty or caught in a jail than you would catch us in a college classroom. So I thought to myself, we need to do something about this. It's not just the statistics that I'm worried about. I, in my job, I actually get to talk to high school students, and high school students are the ones who I ask, tell me about your community. How do you feel about the community you live in? And they tell me in very stark terms. They say, this community is a community that's holding me back. And what they say is that for their peers and the adults and the people who they've grown up with, that it is eating them alive. And if you look at the statistics, they're not wrong. The statistics are chewing them up and spitting them out. If you look at educational outcomes, if you look at health outcomes, if you look at who be not only who becomes a graduate, but who becomes a professional. So I want you to chew on one statistic about this city because it's also a statistic that you could find in any other major city in this country. Here in San Antonio, if you were to compare the lowest income zip code to the wealthiest, just by the life expectancy, it's a difference of 20 years between the lowest income and the wealthiest zip code. Now look, this isn't a talk about a rally against rich people. This isn't a talk about a class warfare or, or uh, a rage against the 1%. But if you're gonna take 20 years of life from my community, you're gonna get a fight out of me if you're not gonna do something about it. So here's how we got here. And I need to be honest, I wasn't completely uh, forthright. I told you that I knocked on 3,178 doors, but what I didn't tell you is that I skipped thousands of doors along the way. If I was knocking on doors one morning, I remember I would walk and there was a block of 20 homes. I would knock on the first door, then I would skip 19, and then I would knock on the 20th. And then in some neighborhoods, there wasn't a single name on my list. And so here's what happens. Tomorrow, one of you is gonna decide that you wanna run for office. And you're gonna hear the same thing I heard. You're gonna talk, eventually you're gonna to talk to a political consultant, an expert who's gonna tell you, this is what you need to do. You have two jobs. First job is you need to raise money. And then the second job is you need to find votes. So the catch is when you raise that money, you're not gonna spend it on anybody who's never voted before in the past. And when you knock on doors, I don't want you wasting any time in any neighborhoods or at any doors where nobody's ever voted before in the past. And so what ends up happening is that's a great playbook and that's a great strategy to win a campaign. We've been doing it for generations, but at the same time, it forces you to ignore entire communities and it's been happening for generations. And for me, as I consider, why is it, when, when community members who I represent scratch their heads wondering, why is it that they're so often overlooked, then I tell them that really, your neighborhood, your community has been invisible for a long time because the campaign consultant who got the guy in power, who got the girl in power, told them they need to ignore 80% of the people that they represent. 80% is actually a high bar. If you can get 20% voter turnout in some of these communities, you're doing a pretty good job. But what we're doing is actually recreating the cycle and building our cities to be more unequal because here's what happens. Persons like me get into the position and we think about, well, what are, where are those neighborhoods where I actually have knocked on doors? Where are those neighborhoods? I've got a million dollars to spend, some public dollars to invest. They're gonna go right back to those communities that in a few years I'm gonna go and ask for my job back. That's where the fundamental problem exists in our communities. That's why we're becoming so unequal. In fact, it reminds me of, uh, you know, I've, I live in Texas, and in Texas, uh, if you believe in something strongly enough, if you're willing to fight for a belief, what you do is you put it on your bumper sticker. 
And a few months ago, I saw this bumper sticker, and I can't share all kinds of bumper sticker philosophy because that's too crude, but here's one that I actually can share with you. It said that bad politicians are elected by good people who don't vote that bad politicians are elected by good people who don't vote. But here's the problem, I know those good people who don't vote. I call them my friends, I call them my family, I went to church with them, I, I played baseball with them, I grew up with them. So the problem is that we're blaming these communities for not showing up, but you don't, we can't forget to, to point the finger of blame in the, in the right direction, which is that these political consultants, they're 100% right. What you do is, what they tell you, is that nobody who's never voted before in the past will ever come out because here's the end conclusion. The person who didn't get their door knocked on, who didn't have any mail sent to them reminding them about election day, people will not vote if you don't ask them to come vote. <laughs> My mind was blown, rocket science. You mean, you mean the person that nobody spent any time on? Uh, the neighborhood, the community that's been forgotten for a long time where no politician knocked on their door, nobody came out to vote? No, they didn't because nobody's actually ever rang their doorbell, nobody's knocked on their door, and so we've got these self-repeating cycles. And so if we're asking ourselves, who's in those positions who's building these cities and these communities to be so unequal? It's really the people in power who are completely ignoring vast amounts of people who are making those communities invisible and this dirty little secret in politics is the only way to get away with this kind of harm to a community for decades. The only, reason, the only way that you get away with 20 years life expectancy difference in one neighborhood or another is to do it to communities that are completely invisible, that are completely powerless. So this is what I did. After a month of following this list, when I ran for my first campaign, I said, this is ridiculous. I'm literally walking past homes of friends who, who I grew up with, or were classmates of mine, people I know because we went to the local restaurants. And so my campaign manager and I, my best friend at the time, decided that we would do this. We wanted to expand the amount of houses and people that we went to because we wanted to change the way that candidates actually speak to the communities that they want to represent. It wasn't just about winning a campaign, it was about shifting this paradigm around communities that for a long time the lights are completely out and it is completely dark. And here's the reason that you do it. Here's a door that I knocked on that wasn't on my list that has actually helped me in my work today. I remember it's a gentleman who's lived for 60 years in my community and he told me that back in 1965, there was somebody who was sitting in a position of power making a decision about where the new university was gonna go and where the new landfill was gonna go. And he said, we're still living through the negative effects because if you look at the new university, they've got brand new roads, brand new hospitals, brand new clinics, brand new public amenities and parks. And when we got the landfill, nothing ever happened here. Community members were only just, the, the, their, their explanation and, and their reason for being here no longer existed and they left. And all we got was an undeveloped piece of, of, of uh, former landfill. And so he said to me, why don't we do this? Why don't we turn that landfill into a park? And a few miles from here, you can visit a park that's a former landfill that's got $10 million worth of, worth of an investment. And that wasn't my idea. That was the idea of a community member who for a long time, whose, his door had never been knocked on, nobody had ever sent him mail. You will be stunned by the richness of information that exists in these communities. If you truly want to transform a community from an impoverished to an empowered one, you'll actually talk to the people who live there. And when I was putting this talk together, I wanted to make sure that I pulled the curtain back on why it is that we see these communities that are becoming so much more unequal while we see these differences in life outcomes. That's important. And I wanted to point out that these uh, political consultants essentially recreate this pattern over and over again. But here's my bigger point. We lose out as a country, as a state, as a community, as a city, when we completely let lose the potential and the talent of the community members who live in these parts of our city, in these parts of our community. Because the crazy thing is, is that these community members, they just don't, they don't just lose confidence in the system, they lose confidence in themselves. But here's the great thing, when you take chance on their door, when you actually talk to them, 
you will be surprised by what happens. You might get one of these community members who might be crazy enough, he or she might be crazy enough, to run for office one day. And if you truly want to transform impoverished communities to empowered ones, you don't do it from the outside in. You do it from the inside out. And you turn the lights on and you bring power to these formerly powerless communities. It reminds me of a quote by Alice Walker. It's one of my favorite quotes. She's a poet and a writer. She said that the most common way people give away their power is by thinking that they don't have any. We know where these powerless communities are. We know where they go to school. We know what communities they live in. We know that they're in areas that politicians completely ignore. And when it comes time to make decisions, people decide to overlook them year after year. So here's my suggestion. If you want to flip and transform these communities, you'll spend some time knocking on their doors and getting to know the folks in these communities that are completely dark. And if you want to change and transform impoverished communities to empowered ones, you'll make sure that you'll knock on every single door. Thank you.